second through fourth. I get back up there on the second guitar. And I feel like I'm so tired. Oh, yeah. Time. Okay, it's a different case. Yeah. And then if I, and if like this one works out, then I have this one. I obviously yeah. have this one. No, they're not. No way. No way. I know, That's I not possible. I doubt it. Dude, that'd be like spending like a thousand bucks in the fucking game. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. No way. Oh shit, this is all on camera. No, I'm just gonna cut it off. Good. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not gonna talk about it. Okay. You get so much blackmail material on you. Yeah. I don't need any more of those. Okay. Should we get going, bro? Yeah. Do you have the image you can on? Yeah. No, but the first one's pulled up because now we're doing this. Oh, right, right, okay. So, alright, so, uh, hey everyone, uh, if, we, if you guys could just get out like a sheet of scratch paper, you're not going to have to pass in or anything, but you're going to want to jot down uh, like a note real quick. Um, so, you know, there was a study done uh, earlier last year, uh, done by the Pew Foundation, and um, basically the study was measuring people's conceptions of income inequality, or rather the income distribution in, in various countries. So we're going to give you guys three choices. And the question is going to be, if you can pick any country to live in, right, which one would you live in? With the understanding that you could randomly be assigned to any quintile. right? So, so a quintile is basically 20% of the population. right? So you could either be in the richest 20%, the next richest 20%, right, or so on. Okay, so let me write them on the board. So Raj is going to give you three options for three hypothetical countries. I'm going to give you sort of the uh, breakdown of the wealth in each quintile, starting from uh, the left would be the basically the highest income folks. So what this is saying is that 20% of the wealth is held by the top 20% of income earners, and so on and so forth. So he's going to give you three options total. And uh, essentially, you're just going to want to pick which one you prefer to live in, knowing that you can't predict what income quintile you'd be in beforehand. Right, so if you were sort of randomly placed in. Uh, and then just to give you some context, the study was given to about 5,000 people with a random sample. Uh, and they found that the, basically the voting patterns of these folks was equivalent to that in the 2004 election. So they tried to keep it as standardized as possible. Um, so we're actually reproducing uh, the same question that they gave on the survey to you guys. We'll see um, how it matches up. So is everyone? Yeah. Question. So how does this work? Each little thing is like yeah. so what, twenty percent of population or wealth. So uh, this would be like um, twenty percent of population, and this is second twenty, third twenty percent of population. So in in country one, each twenty percent of the population has twenty percent of the wealth. Okay. In country two, the Top twenty percent has thirty six percent of the wealth, right, and so on. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and country three, the top one has eighty four, eleven, and so on. Okay. So then you could just take thirty seconds and just pick uh, which is three. Oh yeah. Point two percent. Yeah, this is point two. Sorry, point two and point one. It's just you could whatever. It should probably be point six and point four, so it adds up correctly, but it doesn't really matter. Basically, that's what it is. And yeah, these are all percentages. So basically, it's like saying if the country had a hundred dollars of wealth. Right? In country one, twenty dollars would be in each quintile. Country two, the top quintile has thirty-six, the next one has twenty-one, right? And so on. So everyone have a country where they want to live? You're remember you're randomly assigned, right? So if you pick country three, it's no guarantee you're gonna be up here. You could be, you know, way down here. Alright, who wants to live in country one? Well, I guess for oh, sorry, is everyone, is everyone done? Oh sorry, is everyone done? Everyone's in country? Okay. So, who wants to live in that country one? Yes, we have how many people are all? Three, four, five, six. Six out of the total is 15? People yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, country two? Okay. Three, six, seven, eight. Wait, so someone who's in country three? No, no, no. We only have 14. All right, so 14 people. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, so, you know, what we naturally do whenever we try to do these, uh, classroom polls is ask you guys, right, some of the rationale behind it. So, let's, uh, can we see the hands for uh, category one? Yeah? Um, so, what are you brave enough to uh, volunteer your rationale why you picked it? Yeah? Go ahead. Do it first, and then we'll go. I'm looking at it all, I mean, I would choose probably 
country number two is my next choice, but seeing that three of the categories are less than all the money that would be guaranteed by choosing country number one, I just thought I'd rather choose country number one. Prove your chance. Okay. Yeah. What about you? I mean, I was basically thinking the same thing, except, I mean, 20 and 21% are more or less the same. So really, it seemed like you only had a you know quarter percent chance of being in a better category. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So basically, people are risk averse, right? You don't want to take a risk because, like, and this is obviously could be better, but like we don't want to take the risk. We'll go with the guaranteed money. That's basically what Group One right. is saying. Right. Right. And so, what about Group Two? So. And uh, the remainder of you, essentially. Do you want to offer your thoughts? Yeah. You're not risking as much when the lower distribution is still fairly close to 20, but you, you can gain a lot by going into those 6% if you ran a list in the top. Okay. Yeah, my thought process was kind of similar. It seems like even if you're placed in the lowest 20th quintile, you still have, like, it seems like a society where there's still enough social mobility that you're not destined to be there forever, whereas in group three, if you're in the 0.4%, it's very unlikely you're going to get out of that. Okay. Yeah, so the people in that group two are like risk kind of loving, right? Intermediate. Intermediate, right? right? And these people are like really risk loving. You want to That's what it seems like. Yeah. But no one was really that risk loving. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. So, so that's interesting. Should we tell them the results, Rob? Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's do that. So maybe the re results of what percentage people yeah. in this survey in, in the community. real life, yeah. yeah. Real yeah. Life. So in real life, 47% um, of people picked number two. And we had eight out of 14, four out of seven, so about the same, same right? Yeah. Almost the same. Well, it's a little over 50. Oh, it's a little over 50. And 43% of the people picked this one in the real life. And 10% picked this. So we see roughly, roughly equivalent yeah. in terms of proportionality. Um, clearly, I um, mean, the broader population, two is the most popular as it is here. So there's an interesting parallel there. Now, we're going to hold on to that for a second, and I want to ask you guys one more question that was also in the survey, and that is that if on your scratch sheet of paper, uh, could you estimate what the U.S. percent distribution looks like? So set it up the same way that you see here, um, you know, going down, breaking it into quintiles, and representing sort of what percentage of the wealth is owned by each. So the top 20, so the 20%, so the top 20% own like how much wealth, yeah, next 20% own how much wealth, the next 20% and so on, right? So just take a guess like what you think the U.S. distribution yeah. of wealth is basically, right? So just kind of write this down or kind of get it in your head and then we'll do this sort of, we'll call on people again. predicts that the U.S. <laughs> he's got to take a, a cop out here. 36, yeah. 21. Three, right? Yeah, three. Oh, three. I think it's a two. No, three. Oh, three. Wow. So you really think we're really very unequal society. <laughs> we are. So 84, <laughs> 11, 4, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.4. Okay. So presumably that everyone agree with Max. They wouldn't have a different cap. So everyone agree with, with, with Max, basically? Yeah. Or they don't have... Five, 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 five,
don't think it's like 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> <laughs> Should be 48, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I had 70, 15, 10, 4, 1. 70, 15, 10, 4, 1. Okay. okay. So you're just okay. kind of in between. In between yeah. these two options? Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. okay. So should we, uh... So, so, no, so we got to do the, you know, the... Oh, yeah, why? 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 Right? So we'll start with you, Max. Why? Um, you're the most uh, sort of pessimistic, I guess. Um, we are the 99%. <laughs> oh, God, here we go. <laughs> okay, no, but seriously. Seriously. That's, that's seriously it. That because of the movement? Because of Occupy? Well, I mean, there's that, and uh, there is a giant concentration of wealth in the top tier. And, uh, and just when you, I mean, I just look at I just look at the country statistics. I mean, that's just what comes to mind. OK, OK. So you, so you, you, you kind of had some like prior knowledge of this for a little bit? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> All right, what about you, Pat? Mm. If you listen to more people, um, society, mm -hmm. the rich definitely, like, the top 20, top 40 percent definitely have a very concentration of wealth, but yeah. they're inside of the little income. Okay. So that's fair okay. enough. Yeah, that makes sense. sense. That makes sense with the numbers. Yeah. Alex? Um, I honestly just, like, have the conception that it's pretty bad, but the 84 seem like a lot. Yeah. So seem too bad. It, it, it seem too bad. In, I guess, I feel like there's a, a fair per number in sort of the middle upper class as well. Okay. I don't know. Okay. So what's interesting is that uh, when the same question was asked in the survey, uh, we actually have data on, on what the average uh, response was. And so that was uh, 54, Can you guys see this down here? 54, mm -hmm. 21, 16, 7, and 2. So in fact, that's actually remarkably similar to Baha's number. So uh, Fahad's so the immediate yeah. Fahad, so Fahad's like the, the median US citizen. Yeah, 50%. Fahad, which one? Um, but you know, clearly uh, Max and Alex were a little bit more, um, a little bit more pessimistic, or rather, you know, saw it as more of an unequal light. Now, you know, what is interesting is the actual results. Um, so the actual results is uh, just what Max said. Oh, nice. Um, the US is number three. Um, so, it, so this is sort of where where we are, um, and we'll go over why why that's the case. Yeah. So you know, so we we, we did this activity. That, you know, it's very illustrative, right? So it kind of brings about sort of combining your own preconceived uh, you know uh, feeling about how the U.S. Uh, distribution lies, and force you to sort of take into account with these alternate scenarios, right? So it's it's a good way of getting the point across that um, you know sometimes feeling doesn't exactly merge with statistics, the hard numbers. And that, that's very common in policy. And there are a few more instances of that today in our class. Um, but today is really all about the average American, right? So last week we talked, this is a cliche, but last week we talked about Wall Street. Today is really all about Main Street and, and figuring out how the US economy and, and policies that have been put into place for the last few decades have impacted you know, the average worker and the media. The, the Fahads of, of America. <laughs> Um, so, so that's sort of that. Um, this is basically just a graphical representation of, of the U.S. in right. distribution. And I'm not really sure why it doesn't add up to 100. Um, <laughs> that's why I was kind of doing the yeah, 0.6.4, but I mean, it's close enough, kind of like a rounding here yeah. somewhere. Yeah. But, but, but this is basically what the distribution is like. Go on with <laughs> um, this is sort of another, another one. Um, and just depending on like which year you use. So this was. Kind of like 2004, I think this is more recent, right? Yeah. So the financial crisis kind of took a lot of wealth from the top, right? But but again, basically kind of showing what, what um, the general trend is, right? And, and this sort of the last thing, you know, we didn't get time to ask you guys this, uh, again, in the interest of time, but um, people were asked also in the survey, the very last question was, what do you think is the ideal income? Um, so if you're curious, the actual average result was 32, 20, 20, 16, 12. And if you'll notice, this is also really similar, in fact, almost identical to option number two. Um, and incidentally... So we let them guess, let them guess. Yeah, so incidentally, option number two also correlates to an actual country. 
Um, so does anyone, can anyone guess what that country is? It's Scandinavian. Yeah, Norway. very, very close. So it's Norway. Yeah, you're getting real close. Anyway. Finland, it's, Norway. it's all the same, they're all basically the same. <laughs> yeah. Swedish, Swedish is the actual country. Right, but I'm sure their other ones are all the same. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, so that was a great, that was a great guess. But that's so. There's clearly a pretty dramatic discrepancy into what people think is ideal versus the actual result, right? Mm -hmm. So today we'll sort of go into why that is. And it's also interesting to note that um, that Americans don't want a perfectly equal society. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's the good point. Uh, people don't want 2020, 2020, right? They do want some income inequality, which uh, might be surprising, but I think it, it is sort of. A, Part of the American ethos, right? I just sort of feel like work hard, you should be able to sort of achieve the American yeah. dream, yeah. achieve success. But so we'll we'll get more into this. Um, so you know, as per our usual class, we're gonna switch for a few minutes to talk about current events. Mm -hmm. we're all doing uh, sort of stuff. Yeah. So the really big one uh, for this week so far is the Obama budget proposal. Just came out. Um, you know, fairly in line with the uh, budget proposals previous years. So there's a balance of budgetary restraint, so ensuring that the uh, deficit is managed correctly. Um, but there's a significant portion of the budget allocated to infrastructure spending, more so than previous years. So I think they've allocated $500 billion. And so that sort of falls into our, um, well, if you remember back from week one, where we talked about the fact that government spending um, can boost economic growth, I think that's one of, the, um, one of the motives behind including that as part of the budget. Yeah, and, and uh, the budget also calls for increased uh, taxes. Yeah. Um, this sort of what's been called the Warren Buffett rule, which basically says that uh, millionaires will not pay a lower tax rate than uh, middle class Americans. Um, there's, a, there's a big push to end all the loopholes for big fossil fuel companies, so coal, oil and gas, etc. cetera. Um, and um, the presumption um, that the Bush tax cuts, which I think we talked about before, um, that they actually do expire uh, at the end of this year, right? And they don't get redeemed. Um, I think one thing that just came out, sorry, no, yeah. I don't want to go on, but uh, is that the payroll tax cut looks like it is going to be extended. <coughs> yeah. Um, so that was supposed to expire, and, and that will actually explain what the payroll tax is today. But a payroll tax cut will be extended, looks like, um, it was supposed to end on. February 28th, but it looks like it's going to be continued on, so very, very big news. Yeah, and then one thing to keep in mind about the budget proposal, let's come back to that, is that we actually haven't passed a budget <laughs> in many, many years, uh, definitely since Obama took office. So these, uh, you know, take these budget proposals with, with a pretty big grain of salt because they've never actually come into law um, because of, you know, congressional uh, gridlock. So. And the budget is 146 pages, so uh, we'll put the link up online if anyone wants to. You know, yeah, yeah, so that time read. read the whole thing, right? And then you know, give us a synopsis. That'll be nice. Yeah. Right. The other big, uh, the other current event that actually got a lot of media attention, a lot of for you know, all over Facebook, in fact, at least for me, um, was this whole contraceptives uh, deal. So you know, essentially, what happened, if you've kind of heard of this, was that the administration released a statement um, that essentially said, you know, we're going to mandate uh, by a regulation through the Department of Health and Human Services that um, any hospital or clinic or medical institution, even if it has religious affiliations, uh, would be forced to uh, provide you know, female contraceptives and then sort of, sort of other procedures like abortions and things like that. Is, is that fair? Yeah, so, so, so I think we just want to keep in mind one thing. It's not that a hospital that's, or the, that a doctor has to prescribe right, prescription right. drugs, that's right? Or, birth control, right? It is just that if, like Georgetown University, right, which is a Catholic university, when they offer like health insurance to their employees, that mm -hmm. health insurance plan must cover birth control. Yeah. I mean, does that di distinction yeah, kind of right. make sense? Right, so it's just saying that when Georgetown or, you know, like Methodist Hospital or, uh, I don't know, what is some other Catholic, like a like local like high school or whatever it might be, whenever they offer health insurance plans, they can't just decide like, oh, this does not follow you know, our religious beliefs, so we're not going to offer it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a good distinction. And you know, then what ended up happening was there's a big backlash. You know, they even had the Archbishop Bishop of Canterbury come out and his Sandy administration, and uh, they just released a statement um, a couple days ago that said uh, they would just accommodate that result and that they would exclude any sort of 
uh, institution with religious affiliation from that rule. So it was essentially a backtrack to a compromise solution. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and, and I don't want to get too specific, but it's a backtrack, but then there's another like loophole that they yeah. found where like, they're going to force health insurers to cover it anyways. So like women will not see a difference if they like work out of Georgetown, for example, but Georgetown can then claim like, oh, we didn't provide it, the insurance companies were just mandated to it. Yeah. Provided. So it's kind of a subtle difference. So, like, women are fine with this, right? I and mean, they see no difference. The religious organizations, they're like, okay, we don't have to provide it. And uh, the health insurers are just like mandated to provide it. Yeah. But anyway, that was a huge, huge discussion. And I wish we had time to go into it because it's actually a very, very good a philosophical discussion. Should religious, maybe we should all have to think about that. Should religious or, yeah, Max. Are there any religious health insurance groups? That they used to be. Right? I mean, I think like churches like used to like have their own insurance pools. Very early before on, before we started. have, yeah. But but not anymore. Currently existing, probably not. Not anymore. Yeah, no, they do. They're like my um, I have the president of the local like Thrive It, which is a Lutheran organization that provides um, I know life insurance. I think health insurance. Oh, I see. No, so but it's not necessarily the same thing as the big conglomerate. Yeah, yeah. So that so that isn't an insurance company. It's, yeah. It's I think it's the hospital or the the church pooling its members buying power. To get better rates from existing insurance companies. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. But it's sort of the same. Yeah. But, but anyways, that's definitely something to uh, think about. It does this sort of start a slippery slope with a precedent now? So like, what happens? I'll so throw out an idea and then we'll move on. What happens when uh, gay marriage becomes legal? Um, do religious organizations then like not have to abide by mm -hmm. and um, uh, sort of agree to that? But anyways, everyone can have their own views on this. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a big question. Did, you want to get right into it? Yeah, you should just like, jump right in. With it. Yeah, okay. So, so, as you mentioned before, today's lesson is all about Main Street, the average American, income inequality, right? Things that really strike home at the heart of the middle class and even below the middle class, okay? Um, and really, the, the main vocab word you need to know when we talk about income distribution, income inequality, is the Gini coefficient. This is a term that gets thrown around, around a lot if you've ever taken an economics class. But the Gini coefficient essentially just measures income inequality. Okay, um, you can just think of it, and we won't get into too much detail about how it's formulated. But essentially, um, it's just it's a numerical measure of how income is distributed. So you know, in relation to what we were talking about at the beginning of our class with our poll, we have we have one more poll for today, uh, and that is that we would like for you guys on the sheet of paper that hope we still have out, I'd like for you guys to rank these countries in order, um, in terms of highest income inequality, uh, basically highest inequality to lowest inequality. Let's say so most unequal to yeah, okay. most equal. Does that make sense? So which country has the most unequal distribution of wealth? So that would be like 100, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So which has the most equal, which is obviously 20, 20, 20, 20. And I'll just give you a hint. None of the countries are those extremes. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone uh, see it? So it's UK, US, Nigeria, Iran, China, Cambodia. So we don't want to take too, too much time on this. So does everyone sort of have a guess of what the thing it is? So we can just like make the ranking, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right in there. So should I just, okay, I'll just do this. How about this? I can put blanks. Six, yeah, okay. So this will be like most equal to like, or what did we say, most unequal to most equal? Okay, so this is the most unequal. So who wants to read out their ranking? Just do it really quickly. Lauren, do you wanna? Okay, um, I put USA, then as most unequal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you more than that. Iran, China, Nigeria, Cambodia, and UK. No, 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 UK and Cambodia. So Cambodia is last, last UK is the least single, yeah. So like this? Yeah. So that's interesting. Definitely would not expect <laughs> that. Yeah. Maybe I just Cambodia. scrambled them. <laughs> Who knows? Cambodia, all right. So anyone else? So I, I'm sure that people disagree, yeah. Um, I said 
Nigeria, Cambodia, US, Iran, UK, and China. Okay, one more maybe. Okay, someone has not talked yet. Yeah, please. Okay. What's your name? Sorry. Tiffany. Tiffany, okay. Yeah, okay, so Nigeria, okay. US, yeah. Iran, yeah. Cambodia, mm -hmm. UK, China. Very similar to uh, Bahats. Yeah, yeah, very, very <coughs> Yeah, so this is interesting because when, when we give this class last year, um, it's really people, different. Yeah, yeah, very, very different. So people were much more, um, well, you know, you would not see the U.S. ranked, certainly not last. It was always here or over. Yeah, it, it was definitely <laughs> the top half. So it's interesting how that changes. Um, I think that's a function of the Occupy movement. Maybe so, maybe so. It's a good hypothesis. I guess we'll, we'll never really know. But um, when we pull up the actual rankings to give me an idea, uh, so we'll start with the bottom, right? Um, so, so we can just like number maybe like you know, sorry, for right here like this. This is like <laughs> the real one. So the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the worst one roll. So here yeah. we go. So um, so no, we'll start with the most equal. Okay, the most we'll equal. Right. Okay. A little, a little bit more suspense. Okay. So you know, right off the bat, most equal is the United Kingdom, the UK. So perhaps this isn't too surprising, right? Um, we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago about the, sh the social welfare state in Europe, right? The UK has um, a lot of welfare programs, even with David Cameron cutting back. Um, so second place uh, in terms of equality is China. So uh, Fahad, you and Tiffany, you guys are very close. Just swap the two. So you know China might be somewhat surprising, but uh, you know I guess they go back to this uh, great agricultural heavy roots, yeah. right? So they come from you know the, the five-year plans. Or, Quality is always a big part of those. And yeah, finance is like not a huge part of like China's economy. Yet. Right. Right. Yeah. Finance tends to concentrate well. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, third we have um, somewhat surprising Cambodia. They recovered after the full pods. Yeah, they they recovered a little bit. Um, you know, maybe it's the same sort of effect in China where we see you know not a lot of manufacturing or capital, which again tends to concentrate well. Okay. Going down, we have Nigeria. This should not be surprising, right? Because of all the um, oil wealth gets very concentrated at the top, it does not flow down at all. Uh, lack of transparency, I could go on and on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, Here we our go. next one, this is where it gets interesting, right? So our next one is actually uh, Iran. Yeah, so, you know, if you guys have figured out by now, that place is the U.S. and a, uh, a glorified last place. So, so this is interesting, right? I mean, so you guys, you know, we're, we're quicker to pick up on this. Maybe our uh, intro prompted you a little bit more than prompted last year. So maybe because of the Occupy movement. But you guys were a little bit less optimistic. But, you know, last year people were pretty shocked, right? I mean, Nigeria, Cambodia, these are not sorts of the countries that we expect to be you know, more. Are cool, yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. So we actually can pull up the link. Um, so there's a nice little, we can briefly just show it, I guess. Yeah. There's a nice little CIA, uh, on the CIA website, they have a ranking of all the countries uh, ranked with, with regards to their Gini coefficient. Um, so Raj will be pulling it up in a second. But um, you know, we don't have too much time to go through it, but if you're interested in getting a sense of... Uh, oh, okay, it's, I'll, it's I'll up, but, Okay, that's fine. If you're interested in getting a sense of like where the U.S. ranks, I think it'll be pretty illustrative um, because reality, we're, reality is we're closer to the Nigerias of the world than really the UK's. Um, so it's not so much that Cambodia and China are exceptionally equal, it's just that we're sort of exceptionally unequal. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is just factually correct here. So if you look at this list... Oh, here we go, here we go. Oh, okay. So, you know, so... This is in percentages, but you, it really doesn't matter. So yeah, so uh, again, once again, the Gini Index, um, this is the same vocab. But if you sort of scroll all the way down, see if you can find the U.S. here. So the lower, so so the the small in this case the lower the Gini index the more unequal. So like look way down here, question like Sweden, right? Or rather, yeah, the more equal. equal. Yeah. yeah. So lower number, more equality. So you know up at the top here of the 140 mm -hmm. nations they calculated this for Sweden, like we talked about. Sweden, Norway, Luxembourg, right? Austria, all these yeah. sorts of uh, European Finland. nations. And I'll go to the other extreme now. Go to the other extreme, you know, oh, over awesome. here. We have um, you know heavily African nations, primarily some some Latin South America, America down here, Latin America. Um, and then <laughs> Hong Kong is like a city state, probably, right? So all the wealth is either you're like a really really rich or you're you know. So down in around 40, which is 
uh, ranked 100th in the survey, because 140 is the most equal, is the US, right? It's squashed between uh, Cameroon and, uh, and Bulgaria. Um, so, so yeah, it's an interesting food for thought. It's something that not a lot of people realize. Um, Where's North Korea? <laughs> Where's North Korea? That's a good yeah. question. Do they have data there on might it? not be data on it, is what yeah. I was going to say. They tend to not be as good about that. <laughs> yeah, it's not on here. South Korea is probably on here, though. South Korea is probably on here. Okay, so Ross will be high up. Yeah, Pakistan over here, Ethiopia. So anyway, even Afghanistan is important. Though <laughs> 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 this data maybe. Well, it's 2009. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but it's just so. I mean, it's like hard to collect data in Afghanistan. It is. They kind of try to like it patch is. it together yeah. as a good source. But anyway, it's something to think about, right? And, and if you keep in mind sort of people's ideal distribution from earlier, I mean, clearly the average American, in terms of when they're asked what they want, they are looking for something closer to Sweden. Yeah. What did they get a representative population of the U.S. for that survey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's right. Median income, politically perfectly equal. Okay. Yeah, yeah, everything. It was like as good. Like Pew was like very, very reliable. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pew. Sorry, I don't know. We, did, we probably didn't say that. The, the Pew survey. Okay. So, all right. So you know, before we go, I'm going to give you a little bit more um, in terms of data points here. So right. you know, turn up one of these. There we go. Okay, so what we have here is... Can everyone is, see what's going on? So this graph, uh, say from the newspaper, represents the percent on the y-axis, the percent of national income that's held by the top 1%. Okay. And this is sort of starting in um, the early part of the 20th century, around 1913. This is back 2007. Only 2007. So everyone can see the trend? Kind of keep this in your mind. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of this, a lot of this is historical, and a lot of it's very recent. Okay, so yeah, as we alluded to earlier in the beginning of, the beginning of class, most of the trends we see in, in, in terms of pulling us closer to the Cambodias of the world and, and away from the UKs has happened essentially since 1980. Right, so uh, for a very long time, we we're almost flat in terms of changes um, in, in inequality, but it's accelerated out of the way. There are a lot of reasons for that. So just to keep these uh, graphs in your mind that we're gonna I wish we could just like paste them all on top of each other. Yeah. Really nice, but just keep it in your mind. Okay. Uh, did you have a question, Max? Mm -hmm. I thought I saw you. Um now this is this is I mean kind of the similar graph. This is wealth. So income is like money and that's like wages. <coughs> wealth includes like your like, housing assets, your stocks, your bonds, all that stuff. So obviously top one percent, forty three percent of the financial wealth. Um, and the next four percent, the next five percent, next ten percent, the bottom eighty percent. Similar graphs here. Net worth would uh, obviously subtract out any uh, loans you might have, right? So like wealthier people tend to have like loans for all their investments, right? So that's why that's kind of brought down a little bit. But again, just sort of keep these kind of numbers. I mean, it's obviously not imperative you memorize all. Just kind of keep it in your in your minds. Okay. Now, you know, going back to the, the slide we had before, um, we talked about the fact that, you know, we see a pretty rapid increase starting at around 1980, okay? And, you know, the natural question when anyone really sees this is, well, why, right? So why is all of a sudden this change when for about half a century it, it was relatively stagnant? And there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, perhaps most notably is uh, a decline, a decrease in the marginal tax rate, okay? So this is the top marginal tax rate, the, the taxes, percent, the income taxes paid by the uh, highest income earning Americans, right, the highest bracket. Um, so this graph gives you an idea of how that's changed basically over the course of the last 100 years or so. So uh, notice that as marginal tax rate goes up, um, if we just come back to this, the share of wealth is falling. Does everyone see that? And Notice that uh, post-1980, just as uh, Raul said, concentration of wealth is going up, and look at this marginal tax rate, and basically just coming right down. And you know, so the number one statistical law, right, <laughs> not break, is that you know correlation does not equal causation, right? And, and so, you know, we can't prove with these graphs, right, and we're not suggesting necessarily yeah, that there's some sort of causation, but clearly, at least the least we can say is that the correlation is very strong. Uh, in fact, almost one-to-one -one mapping. Okay, uh, we have some other graphs here. Now, this gets into what's called a capital gains tax. And 
we mentioned this briefly uh, before, but again, capital gains, remember, are the taxes that are charged on your sale of a house, sales of stocks, when you sell your yacht, whatever it might be, any kind of capital gain, which means you selling a stock, things of that nature. And primarily, um, these sorts of transactions are made by wealthier individuals, right? By the Warren Buffetts of the world, the Bill Gates, those who are like, doing a lot of investing, Mitt Romney. Um, so what you're seeing is that, again, in like 1980, which is sort of back here, right? We were back into like 28 percent-ish, and then we sort of, you know, came down, and now we're at 15. Again, this is a projection if the Bush tax cuts expire, so I wouldn't, so this is certainly not set in stone, right? Because it's probably not going to expire. But currently we're at the 15%. So again, right, a decline in the capital gains rate, right, which affects primarily wealthier, wealthier individuals, corresponding, right, or is it correlated with an increase in the proportional. And you know, in combination, the two combine the decrease in the top marginal tax rate and the decrease in the capital gains rate has resulted uh, in very low effective tax rates on, on sort of the wealthiest Americans, right? So uh, this is actually just income tax, right? So, so, oh, so it also includes capital gains. Yeah. Right? Okay. So the blue is the highest marginal tax rate. So that goes back to, I'm sorry we're going back and forth, but that's this graph. Yeah. Okay, that's the blue. And then this graph is the red. And then, do you want to explain? Yeah, yeah. And, and the yellow is, is what's called the effective tax rate, right? So that is to say, um, you know, these are, so these rates represent um, the individual rates on the parts of the income of an individual, okay? So, you know, let's say if I earn $100,000 in wages and a million dollars in capital investments, or a million dollars off of stocks, uh, my effective rate, my, the actual tax rate I pay will be in between the 15% capital gains rate and the 35% um, top income tax rate, right? Because it'll be a weighted average of those two. And because such a big portion of my income comes from capital gains, um, it'll be much, my actual tax rate will be much close, closer to the 15 than the 35. So the way we like measure effective on tax rate is we say you make $100 and then you write a check to the US government for $10, let's say, your effective tax rate is at 10% because you're paying about 10 bucks out of 100, right? So uh, this is on the t richest, 400 Americans, this is like not from some sham website from IRS uh, data, I just want to disclaimer <laughs> that, right? So what is this saying? That the top 400 Americans pay on average like 17% tax rate. So that means if they make a million dollars, right, they pay like 170,000. Yeah. And the other interesting thing, you know, sort of going back to what Roger was saying earlier, um, the effective rate closely tracks the capital gains rate. Um, and, you know, that's something because you know, once you have a certain degree of wealth, right, the Warren Buffetts, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the, uh, um, the Bill Gateses, you know, most of your additional wealth comes in the form of investments, right, through venture capital or stocks or what have you. So, you know, that's corroborated by intuition. Okay. So, taxes are sort of one potential cause. So, the next one is what I would call a dramatic rise in CEO pay. Um, and essentially what we've seen is the pay of CEOs has far and away eclipsed the pay of sort of the average worker at a company. And this has all happened, you know, again, within the last 30 years or so. Um, and, and how we measure that is, um, you know, we can take the ratio of average CEO pay to average worker pay. So at a manufacturing company, for example, you can take the CEO compensation, over the compensation of your essential, your baseline factory worker on the floor. Yeah. And so what you've seen is since 1965, and particularly starting in about around the early 80s, you see this ratio climb very dramatically. Um, in fact, order of magnitude, well over order of magnitude in the last 50 years or so. So then I mean, the obvious question, right, is how does this compare to other countries, right? Is the US 262 times sort of standard, or is it like much higher? And in fact, uh, as you guessed, it's much higher, oh right? right? So other countries, I think we have Japan on here, all, I mean, it's always been well known, right? Like Honda, Toyota, they take very low salary compared to their uh, average workers. And I look at the US sort of skying up, up here. Right, uh, all right. So again, that's just sort of another uh, another metric. Yeah, so now you may be thinking, well, why is it so much higher than in the US and other countries? So, and, and I believe someone asked about that. Um, 
cute class to go. You know, no one's really quite sure. Um, and, and you'll hear a lot of answers from, uh, from sort of policy research scholars and economists. Uh, I think it's a combination of culture, of the fact that um, you see a global, um, global competition for CEO talent. You know, that's, that's a big argument that's made. Um, and in terms of all sorts of uh, interplay of factors, um, one, of the, one of the common things that also gets brought up is the board of directors, uh, which sort of determines the CEO's compensation, is often handpicked by the CEO, so there's sort of like back and forth there. So, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for that, and we don't really have time to get into all of them, but if you're interested, we can send you some articles. It's a very good book, Winner Take All Politics, explains all of this. Yeah. So, but, but anyway, that's, that's sort of the statistical reality in terms of data. Okay. So, so we've seen decrease in our taxes, right? Increased CEO pay, and we've seen a decrease in household <coughs> income, right? So, or I, I mean, essentially a flatlining, right, in real household income. So basically, this has not changed much in, what, uh, 40 years. So the blue is essentially your, your middle class, your median income. The red line is your top earners, the 90th percentile, right, the top 10%. And, the, and so this 10th is, the, the yellow is the bottom, percent in terms of household income. And if you look, uh, it, it's even gone down since the peak in, what, like, 98. Yeah. Right, it's sort of come down. Um, this has been just completely flat, uh, and again, sort of a blip here in the 90s and then back down. Right. So, you know, even in, in these numbers, we're seeing a widening, right, where you see the bottom 50% relatively stagnant, or sort of the 90, 90 uh, percentile and above, pretty, pretty solid increase um, in your weight. So this is real, so this is sort of accounting for inflation. Okay, so just uh, some more, this is a graph-heavy uh, presentation. So, now this is the showing how did the income gains get distributed over time, right? So if the United States as a country gained $100, so we became $100 richer as a country, who basically earned that money, right? So from 1947, so the end of World War II, to 79, it was you know pretty evenly distributed, right? I mean, basically sort of like all the quintiles were basically doubled their income. That's what this is saying. Yeah. Um, but since from 1980 to 09, it's been a stark difference, right? And 55% of the income gain has gone to the top quintile, and the, and the bottom quintile has even gone down, right? So that means that they've lost money in the past uh, 30 years. And if you're interested in sort of like what the cutoffs are, there's some nice reference numbers here. Um, so this is just household income. So this, you know, pretty much anyone making more than, you know, sort of the 112, 112,000 classified as the top. So again, the majority of wealth gains has gone to the top in, in the last 30 years. Okay. And you know, one of the big drivers of this change, particularly in the fact that you've seen a stagnation in the uh, first 60% in terms of income of the country, um, a big part of that is, it's talked about a lot, and that is the erosion of manufacturing jobs. Okay, so you know, some of it are these structural economic changes, um, and this is a big one. Uh, because you know, for most of the you know middle part of the 20th century, um, where you see post World War II American manufacturing booms, right? Um, we are um, pretty much majority of everything produced in the world, produced in America. Our factories boom, cars, TVs, everything produced in our borders. And you know, for most of that time, a factory job was a solid way to a middle class income. Okay, it was a stable job. It paid well. Um, you got good benefits. You got your car. You got your house. You got your it was the middle class dream. But for a number of reasons, um, the, the very common one gets talked about, right? Cheap resources of labor um, in the developing world. Technology. Seen, technology is another big part of it. Uh, a lot of reasons, again, we don't have time to go into, but we've seen that decline very, very dramatically. Um, pretty much in the last 20 years, I mean, you really see the, the drop off happen around 1990. Um, so, so again, blue collar jobs kind of going overseas and sort of compounded or sort of, I mean, this is you know, kind of accentuated by the fact that the real minimum wage and union membership has declined. So minimum wage, right, that's the sort of minimum amount you pay someone per hour. And the real minimum wage, yes, this graph is you know, kind of challenging to read, but this is a, you want to look at the red line, right? So that's $7.50, right, in a, in a 73, and it's now down to, or I mean, stay exactly the same, basically. Yeah, I mean, a little bit closer to six. Now, 
No, no, we're up here. Oh, I see. But, but notice the peak in 1980. Okay, and then it's sort of come down. And that's corresponded, right, with a decline in union membership, right? So everyone that knows, obviously, what our unions are, right, in the office place, right, in the workspace, and they've drastically been declining. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're virtually gone in, in, in the private sector. I mean, I, I think certainly, like, Rice University does not have a union. I, I could say that very, very safely. <laughs> right. Okay? And then, you know, the last big driver of this uh, income inequality is what, what we've seen in healthcare. Um, and we'll go into that next week, so we'll table that discussion for now. What we've seen is a rising healthcare cost that really hurt you know, sort of the average American the most. So the question becomes, like, what are the effects of all of this, right? And, you know, since, you know, we're don't have too much of time here, we're going to kind of speed through this, but it's on the notes. But I think the big one we want to talk about is the decreased income mobility, right? So income mobility basically says how easy it is to go from bottom quintile to the quintile right above you, or from quintile four to quintile three, or so on. And basically that has gotten a lot harder because the space between the quintiles has gotten bigger, right? So you can think of it like a ladder, right, each step on, for each like rung on the ladder has gotten wider apart, right, so it's harder to climb the ladder. You know, and the reason we bring this up is because, you know, the common counter argument is that, well, you know, even if America is more unequal, it doesn't matter because there's so much flux, you know, even if you're at the bottom, you can climb to the top and be in that 84% quintile, and it'll be fine, because as long as the American dream is intact, well, you know, it doesn't matter if things are unequal, because talent rises to the top and all that. But what we've seen um, is a decline in income mobility that has mirrored this decline in uh, income equality. Um, to the point where, and we'll have a graph of this later, I believe, um, to the point where we're actually less of an income mobile state than our partners in Europe, for example, uh, like in the UK. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. So, and obviously, sort of one of the other issues we have is poverty. Um, and I mean, I mean, you can see these like numbers, uh, they're very, very sort of high, and again, it's by race, and it's obviously certain uh, ethnic groups are disproportionately affected uh, by this, and we can see the same thing um, by age. Uh, so you look at sort of children, 22% uh, of American uh, children, this is from the uh, latest uh, census data, so from like last year, right, uh, in the poverty, right, so this is sort of a huge, huge uh, shift uh, in of what we're used to. I mean, I look at this back here, right? 15%, right, in 1970, and up to you know, 22%. That's a lot of people, right? 7% of a 300 million population. It's a lot. Right, right. So, you know, these are, these are the tangible, real effects, right? I mean, these are real people's lives. Yeah, oh, yeah, good. Then maybe from the AARP. Because that's not easy. Good question. Um, After class, we were <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe I said uh, so, so, you know, so these are real Americans' lives that are being affected. So, you know, we, this is a very graph-heavy class, uh, as Raj mentioned, but, you know, it's kind of ironic because what we're really talking about is how it impacts the lives of ordinary Americans, right? And, uh, and what we're seeing is more people in poverty, really, than, than, than ever before, at least in a very long time. And one of the out offshoots of that, the tangible, visible, real offshoots of that, is what we've seen in the occupied movement, okay? So, Max is joking about this earlier, we are the 99%. You know, I'm sure by now, most of you have at least heard of like, you know, top 1%, we have 99%, all that. I mean, at least the vestiges of the Occupy movement. But this was an entire protest, which you know, we, we really don't see in America, right? Protests are very, very rare. And we saw a big movement uh, across the country where people came out and said, you know, this is not okay. Um, and it was really driven by this, this uh, income inequality increase. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's sort of one of the sort of big results of this, and it, it's like it, the the attention was sort of like rising, and just was, I mean, like, you'll never know in all these sort of protests, man, like, what is the key that sort of sparks it, um, but but again, it, it happened to uh, happen now. So, um, you know, there are some, like, possible solutions to this, and, and again, don't want to spend too much time on this, but obviously, like, um, improving a U.S. education system would do, would do like, wonders, right, because if People have, are uh, better educated, they have increased chance to sort of move up, right? You could like make the tax code more progressive, right? That kind of goes to the millionaire tax, right? This sort of Warren Buffett 
tax rule. Yeah. Um, and it, so this is uh, at the primary levels through, you know, post-secondary education. So not just college, but also kindergarten and elementary school, the entire range. Yep. Um, and we have a class dedicated to education um, in a few weeks. Another another easy one is uh, you know more progressive tax code. Okay. So um, we showed you those graphs earlier about the effective tax rates. You know, if I'm a uh, if I'm your middle class American and I'm you know I'm having to pay 25 to 30 percent of my income in taxes, income taxes, and you know those sort of making more than me are only paying you know 15 or even less percent in some cases, um, you know that is going to heighten inequality. So the argument is, well, if we try to close some of these loopholes, if we say you know the capital gains rate jumps up if you're making beyond a certain income, that would also work to balance things as well. Yes. Um, one of you guys said earlier when we were looking at a graph that had like projected views yeah. that you didn't think mm -hmm. the Bush tax codes would actually expire. So why do you say that Obama probably won't follow through on that? So yeah. So if Congress does okay. nothing, good point. <laughs> it expires. If Congress just does nothing, it expires. But they'll probably. But uh, my guess is Republicans say you extend it, and then we will you know, give you like something you want. And that's what happened last December, right? I mean, Obama said we'll extend it, and they said we'll give you don't ask, don't tell, repeal, treaty with Russia, food safety bill, 9/11 first responders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Um, okay. Very good. And oh, I think just one last graph about the uh, geographic differences. Uh, uh, in poverty, so but keep in mind with the Texas. Texas. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the South in general, right? Not doing all that great. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway. But, but anyhow, I just want. Somehow it's like a clean. Look at look at that. Sarah Palin's doing well, or she was, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta give her some. It's really ironic. DC is like a little island. Little yeah, little I mean, we observed that when we were there. Yeah. It's very urban, so like, there's lots of. It's very expensive, like cost of like, living is just so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and incidentally, the state with one of the highest per student spending. It's year. the highest. Highest, the highest. Fourteen thousand dollars per pupil per year. Yeah. So again, you know, we have a class. We have a class all on that. We'll talk about this. But anyway, so. so the question then becomes, and you guys have heard this term thrown around, the social safety net, right? So what does the government do to try and mitigate some of this poverty, right? Try to mitigate some of the income inequality. Right, so they have what are called welfare programs, right? I think I'm sure you guys all you guys have all heard of right these these programs. And um, we just wanted to start by dispelling a myth, right? So there's there, there's this big myth that goes around that says, oh, welfare payments just go to you know lazy people who sit around and don't do anything, they don't work, blah blah blah. So there's just been a definitive study was released three days ago that said 91% right of welfare payments go to senior citizens, people who are disabled, and people who work, right? So that just dispels the myth right there that the majority of our welfare goes to, you know, people who just sort of like sit on their ass and do nothing, right? And, and, and we just had to dispel that because too many people believe that's just completely factually wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's true that, you know, all these things, I mean, they're all sample, right? So clearly there are people out there who are getting well, for payments, taxpayer checks, that really shouldn't be getting them, right? And that, that certainly is indisputable. But what's clear is that at least a solid majority, you know, nine out of 10 or more um, of, of, the, of every, basically nine dollars or every $10 is going towards where it needs to go, okay? So at least we can sort of get past that initial hurdle of, of the role of the government, right? The money is being allocated at least respectively well. So then, you know, the question becomes, well, how should we spend it, right? So, I guess we'll give you a sense of, of what it's currently being spent on. So the, the major uh, aspects of the social safety net, the social uh, safety net portfolio, uh, some of the obvious ones, right? So one is food stamps. Okay, so this is simply <clears throat> yeah. No, I mean, so I mean, you guys all know what food stamps are, right? Yeah. So that's one of the huge ones. Um, the the yeah, next one is the earned income tax credit. Don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically, if you make below seventeen thousand dollars a year, you pay a negative tax. So the government pays you money, but they only pay you the money if you are working and have a job. So you don't get the money if you make zero dollars, but you get the money if you like make. I think it's between like ten thousand and seventeen thousand a year. So it's to supplement the income, but to incentivize you to work. 
And of course, you know, the really the biggest social safety program of all, or the one you've all heard about, is social security. Okay? Um, and you know, I'm sure you know about the basic idea to provide some sort of income for, for seniors who have retired. Um, you know, it goes back many, many, many decades. Um, and it's, social security is funded, in case you're curious, through what's called the payroll tax. So Rod mentioned this earlier. So the, the, the payroll tax is 6% uh, of your income, right? 3% is paid by you, 3% paid by your employer. And it's just a deducted out sort of automatically. Some of you guys may have seen when you, I mean, you get paid from like rise, they have deduction there for that. Um, and basically, I mean, the intuition is, right, young people pay in, right, older people take it out. And Social Security gets talked about a lot, uh, you know, more than any other welfare program these days, because you know, there's, there's a sense, of, there's an apocalyptic sense about it, right? I mean, in, in debate after debate, in news story after news story, people say, um, you know, what gets talked about is Social Security is going insolvent, right? I'm sure, you know, how many of you, just to shoot, see a show of hands, how many of you have heard um, the notion that you will not get access to Social Security money that you put in? Yeah, yeah so, this. yeah, pretty much everyone. Um, so, We're here to dispel that myth also. Yeah, 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 and, and, if you're curious, what are the problems, right? Like, so the reason people talk about Social Security a lot is because that ratio between worker, young worker putting in money and old sort of retiree taking out has changed a lot. Um, and in fact, it's gone down a lot. So, you know, the age movement term gets tossed around a lot, but, you know, in case you're unfamiliar, um, what we see because of the demographics is um, an aging of the population, right? So a burgeoning of the um, elderly demographic. We see a lot more elderly folks um, Days because of the way sort of the population boom came about after World War II, and you know as a result, you know there's this. I mean, the reality is that that's going to put a lot of strain on the source, on the social security program, right? Um, more money is going out than, than money is coming in. So, I mean, this is clearly like not sustainable, right? So you're going to think at some point it's going to run out, and yes, it is going to run out. But in 75 years, it's going to run out. And in 75 years, the shortfall, right, so the amount that you need to, like, make up is 0.8% of the GDP. So that's, like, nothing, right? And here's the other thing that, like, no one will tell you is that there have been presidents, I'm not going to, like, name names, right, who have withdrawn money from the Social Security Trust Fund to pay for something else, right? So if you're taking money out from it to pay for something else, right, then you can just as easily put money into it. Right? So it basically, what, I don't know what the upshot is, is the money's not going to run out, so you don't need to worry about this. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you, we're bringing this up because what ends up being is that Social Security has sort of turned into a political and media scare tactic. And the, and the reality is, minor minor adjustments in Social Security, which will happen you know, at some point before it all goes insolvent, right? People, things get down at the last minute, not six days. But minor adjustments essentially make it solvent again. So there is, really is no solvency for problem in Social Security. There is a solvency pro uh, problem in the other big social safety net component of the federal government, which is health care. Um, and that's the topic of next week. But the key thing to remember, the key takeaway here is that Social Security is really not in trouble. At least it's not in trouble that you probably think it is. So we just wanted to, here briefly at the end, come back to the income mobility aspect, right? I think we had talked about how that's sort of gone down, right? And um, so you know, the Basically, uh, the income inequality is widened, right, and the income mobility is at least stayed the same over time. It's definitely not gone up, but there's uh, some evidence to suggest that it's actually gone down. Um, and we wanted to compare it uh, to other countries, right? right. So, sort of, uh, again, kind of dispel some notions. So this is called the Great Gatsby Curve. Um, we did not give it the name. Yeah. Um, but basically, what this shows is um, on the y-axis, it has basically the ability to move up, right? Where a lower number means you can move up, I mean, means you have like a like higher opportunity to move up, right? And a high number means you have a lower opportunity to move up, right? And this is income inequality. Again, measured by the Gini coefficient. So higher Gini coefficient means more unequal. So basically, what do you see? That so as countries become more unequal, right, the income mobility goes down, right? And perhaps this is intuitive, right? So Raj likened it to the metaphor about the ladder and the rungs. Um, but this clearly dispels the idea that we can maintain high mobility, right? We can maintain the essence of the American dream, right? Which is 
a classless society, a society where you know, the janitor can become the CEO, um, that that cannot be essentially obtained without some measure of equality, right? There's this there's this law here, this one-to-one -one mapping almost of the two. Okay. So that's a pretty powerful notion, right? So um, and, and it's it's born through in the data, but it may be maybe counterintuitive. <clears throat> and again, this basically just shows you the same thing. So the taller your curve, the harder it is to move up. So look at so I mean the USA is here compared to like Denmark. Right, for all these Scandinavian, yeah, Scandinavian Sweden. Right. right. So again, we just wanted to sort of make the point. So, so I mean, if someone tells you like, oh yeah, income inequality's gone up, but it's like so easy to move around, that's not really true at all. I mean, with the data, right? You know, so earlier we were talking about possible solutions, right? Education, reforming CEO pay, changing the tax code, even maybe trying to bring manufacturing jobs back, right? So, these are all you know initiatives that the government can take. If you know, if we decide that we need to combat this increasing income inequality, but this really begs the question, right? And this is a fundamental philosophical question um, that underpins this entire course, that underpins policy in general, right? And and that is, what is the role of government? Okay. So, does you know, should the federal government sort of stay out of this issue and and not you know redistribute wealth, or should it take an active stance and say, look, we need to change the tax code, we need to um, maybe have a stronger social, social safety net and fight these trends. And this is interesting because, you know, particularly in America where um, there's a particularly big faction, such as represented by the Tea Party, um, that argues that we need smaller government. I mean, what is clear that smaller government is not going to change these trends. In fact, it will only really accelerate these trends. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? I mean, you know, I guess we'll start with, does anyone think the government should take a more active role? Activist okay. government. You want to so the communists in the room can speak. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, provide your thoughts. Um, the income inequality. Okay, first of all, the government is very hands-on about our economy as it is, and they are very involved. And it's not like stepping out would help. But what I think can be a first step towards approaching the inequality in an effective way is just more. Um, regulation within the financial markets that's causing a lot of this upper um, percentile to control a lot of the wealth because the financial market is essentially unregulated and not very taxed and so it's not going to be a problem of class warfare if they just get a handle on um, regulating that side of the market where a lot of the money is going into, a lot of the jobs are going into, where a lot of the wealth is being created, like they regulate everything else. It's not about busting up unions and all the things that are maintaining Right now, a flat line wage amount when we're seeing an acceleration in the higher managerial positions because it's in the financial market that doesn't have the type of regulation that we've seen before. That's giving an unfair advantage. It's not that there needs to be regulation versus. So, you know, to play devil's advocate here, yeah, that's um, fine. <laughs> to play devil's advocate here, you know, I would say that, you know, there's one thing that we didn't really get a chance to talk about is the difference between absolute poverty and relative poverty. Okay, so if I were to play a devil's advocate, I'd say, well, just because the financial sector um, is doing better, you know, that doesn't mean the average the average American is doing worse. So why should we overtax and overregulate the financial sector and bring those guys back down? Right? That doesn't seem fair either. And B, and B, increasing regulation is going to stifle our growth, and then our country's not going to be as rich, and then sort of our GDP will fall and bell, hurt us rather than like global. Your political sense. Do you have a, a response to that? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, does it matter if our GDP is increasing if the majority of our population is living in impoverished circumstances, even if it's relative poverty, if their quality of life is not very good? Should we care about GDP? Should we or should we? I'm just wondering. Oh, you're asking or you're just like, saying? No, 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 it's kind of throwing it out like, there. Max, you want to respond to that or is this something? I know. I'm, I'm, Going along with it, well, okay. you know, if uh, you know, if Paris Hilton goes out and buys a fifty million dollar yacht, and I go to my you know, tutoring uh, job, I see these kids who have, you know, filled in molars because they can't afford dental hygiene, all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, why can't they be the guys buying the fifty million dollar yacht? Why can't Paris Hilton buy a fifteen million dollar yacht? Let uh, these guys buy a boat. So basically, you want to like redistribute wealth. That's what you're saying. 
Well, yeah, but I'm not going to be like, here, give me your money and throw it at them. So I'm, how do you want to do it? It has to be more, it has to be more, you know, what government So the government's <laughs> just like raise taxes on me as a yeah, rich raise person. Taxes. I've worked so hard to earn the money. Oh. Right? Yeah, yeah because, you, that's not fair. yeah, because you maintain your daddy's banks and all that, yeah. No, but, but then I'm like Warren Buffett, right? I didn't like maintain anything, right? I just like rose up. Right? Yeah, Warren Bill Buffett Gates, himself wants to be I just so worked really hard Bryan. to earn my money. But, yeah, Kobe Bryant, when he gets injured and gets off the field. <laughs> as far as, the court, but as, far as like, working hard, I feel like the people who have gotten that rich, they win for the work amount of work they put in, may not have gotten that rich if it wasn't for all the advantages that they're being given that's to fair. get that rich. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great kind of argument. What about um, orange pickers in California? You know, mess up their hands because they're picking oranges with all those chemicals. Working hard all their life, making five dollars a day. They're working hard. They deserve some. Uh, do you want to jump in? Oh, and we had many, many hands. Um, yeah, Alex for Sandra. Oh. Well, go ahead. We'll, we'll go in order. Like, well, so, Vadi first. Well, well, I was just gonna say that, like you said, there's really no. But if somebody's working hard, they should get the money. So it's just about making the society more mobile, yeah. I guess. Yeah. You should be able to apply to the richest sector. Like that option should also be available. So I guess providing more education, providing more healthcare, providing the poor, that should be sort of like regulating the top. Okay. Like providing more benefits. So so what you're saying is less on the, like, the wealth redistribution aspects and more on providing opportunities. Right? Does that seem reasonable? So n not just less on wealth distribution, but if, if somebody is let's say like Warren Buffett, and you have like a fair tax system, then why not? Like why are you not allowed to be rich? But yeah. there, should, there should be an opportunity to go. Focus on mobility, not inequality as much. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, okay. a, that's a fair point. You got many, many answers. Yeah. Um, well, can you just like raise the inheritance tax? Because if people work for their money, they should get it. But if they inherited their money, I mean. <laughs> but then but then the so argument fine. is like, so then like rather than just like giving the money to my kids when I die, I'll just like, like swipe their credit card and like all the purchases that they make while I'm alive would just be made by me. Right, so you can easily scan that, right? So then if like they buy a house, like I'll just pay for my kid's house and my kid's car and everything. So then I'm just like passing the money to them. And, right, so it's, so it's really hard is what I'm trying to say. To just, well, wouldn't, couldn't that be like a gift tax then? Like, can't anyway. you work Yeah, no, so yeah, exactly. So you'd have to like design that. That's a very good point, right? So you're saying to basically to try to reduce the concentration of wealth by generation. Right? So that if like your parents are rich, you don't get to just stay rich off of your daddy's bank account to quote max. Right? Yeah, that makes sense. Why? Why? Why not? I I think that's completely like, fair. It's like if your it's your family's money. It's like, you have like your parents have the opportunity. Like if you have like I don't think that's yeah that's the problem. yeah. So so again to to go off what I said again I'm playing devil's advocate here. You know, if I'm if I'm uh, if I got to, to the top based on my riches, based on my hard work, why shouldn't I be able to give it to my kids? Right? And, Is there and, a philosophical uh, issue there? Yeah, and like like Rush said, like the person can also just like like you can find loopholes, or you can be like, well, I'm not gonna work hard because I'm gonna work hard till I'm 80, then I'm gonna die, and then my children are not gonna have anything, so I'm not gonna work hard to begin with. Yeah, that's a fair point. And and you can also like, make the argument that people work hard so that their kids can have a better yeah, life, that's right? A part of that. so that's yeah. like a fact, that, that's a part of their like utility function. Yeah, and that makes sense when you're on the lower levels, but when you're getting up to like making $2 million versus $50 million, I mean, it's just kind of ridiculous. Yeah, but I need a two Whether or not your kids are going to live in the <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so Cassandra, you kept cutting you off. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, this is making really all that relevant to the current no, 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 please, <laughs> please, 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 please. This is good. Uh, just this idea that, well, all right, so I worked hard and I'm rich, so screw everybody else, completely ignores that society is interdependent. And if there's less inequality and more people have opportunities to rise to different positions in society, we wind up benefiting everybody because, I don't know, if there's some kid who grew up in the projects and never really had much of a chance, you know, they could have been a person to cure cancer or whatever. And we wind up limiting our potential, like, just as, as a country as a whole, if we deny better equal access. Yeah, Lord. When we, okay, we were talking about the growth of the GDP, but a lot of this uh, stagnation in um, lower income, like workers' wages that have gone on for the past 20 years have really stifled the GDP. Like, there's a lot of the, G like, 
um, growth that the lower class can be responsible for in the past few years. And so, um, just redistribute, not the, uh, not the <laughs> idea of redistributing, like. but there has been research that says that, that, that the lower class can be responsible for growth in the GDP, especially because we were always talking about consumers contributing to the GDP. If we really look at that as an actual economic factor, people spending money on televisions and things like that versus investing, then it's going to be obvious that putting money in the lower classes areas want to wind up in still economic growth. So what you're sure. saying is you want to take the money away so that I can't buy my tenth television so you can buy your first one. <laughs> That's what you're saying. It's not about like taking money away though. I mean, there's just, it's inherent in the system the way that these people are seeing massive growth. And it's not about they literally worked hard to earn $50 million a year. There's types of things once you get to a certain point then because the market's unregulated, there's a way to take advantage of the system to grow your wealth at exponential rates without having worked yourself nearly as hard to $50 million a year. I feel like that's being communist when you're rich. It's like, well, if you're, com if you're rich, then I'm going to send you to a communist country. That is not even close to what? <laughs> so, so, reality. So, so, you know? so what's an example? So you mentioned regulation a so, couple times. Tell us one specific thing, right? right <laughs> yeah, like, like, what's an example? Let's I mean, be clear. I'm not that far into policy that no, yeah, no kind of it's just spot. like we talk so, about redistributing income as like literally taking the money out of the pockets of sports stars and things and paying it to the lower class, but it's not it's not the same thing. Well I mean they're only and, able to earn these amazing amounts of money because of everybody else, really. And it sort of just reassesses the value of everybody contributing towards these super earners. Uh, you, were, you were saying earlier, does that sort of address? I actually agree with her. Like, that's our value. Like the, Because parents are not making that much money, is that like America has values. That is lined up with her. Right. <laughs> well, people tune or, in and prime time to yeah. watch, right? So she gets exactly. the top advertisers and yeah. that. I think like, instead of taxing her, I think it's like, Correcting the society is more. <laughs> 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 yeah. So you're saying we gotta convince people to stop watching Jersey Shore. <laughs> 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 so watch the Green Sicario. Perhaps we start educating people. Yeah. They'll get an interest in Green Sicario versus Jersey Shore. Yeah. 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 People don't watch Paris. <laughs> 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 That's the implication. We should pull this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's pull the right campus. Yeah. 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 Well, we're never gonna get the education for people who can't reach the education if we're devoting our money to push tax cuts to save the money if we're yeah, making $50,000. That's a good argument. So, you know, the so education is isn't free. Uh, so even if it's done well, uh, it costs a lot of money. And, you know, you're going to... It's the easiest, the easiest thing to do is get the money from that 84% of the wealth quintile, not the not the bottom 20 that has like 0.4% of the wealth, right? You're not going to be able to pay for anything that way. So okay. it, it is very interrelated. Max, you agree. Max, yeah. Um, and, um, feel free, guys. Uh, I just feel like when you make enough money, it gets to a point where you're not making money for the happiness of yourself or for your lineage or for uh, just self-preservation or anything, survival. And it becomes just a matter of greed, and that can really spiral out of control. Making money for the sake of making but money. But then, like, yeah, exactly. I mean, the yeah, counter argument is, I mean, that like brings me a pleasure, so I should be able to do it, right? Well, it's making what money gives me pleasure. Well, the people who kill other people for pleasure, we lock them up. Well, okay, I mean, that's, 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 that's a really that's, that's, yeah, it's really not good argument. No one can do everything they want. But I limit that. But my that desire to, money. yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when did we decide that the like someone's desire to give their kid ten million dollars when they're you know when they move on to inheritance tax outweighs the ability of a child to like have food security in their home? You know what I mean? Like we talk about the inheritance tax shouldn't be raised because people should be able to give their kids hundred million dollars on their twentieth birthday, yep. but when twenty two percent of the children in America don't necessarily have food security and they don't necessarily have their like the rest of their lives secured, how where do we? Where do we say that that's not interfering with their ability to like pursue happiness or to thrive in our society? You know what I mean? But that yeah, because no, we right. make, we make laws to say that murder is interfering with other people's happiness, security, and their ability to like live on. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <call the> death. <laughs>
There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer here, right? At, at some level in policy, right? So this class, this is a motif. In this class, we give you the data, we give you the facts, like, you know, the actual research being done in the policy. But there's a certain extent to where the data can only take you so far, right? And after that, it's about what do you believe in, right? What is your vision? What is your set of ideologies and philosophies about the country, the role of the government, um, the role of society, even? And, and that's something that we can't, no one can teach you that. Right, that's that's ingrained. That's sort of your yourself to formulate. So, you know, hopefully we, we can see that discussion. But it's good to see, and and uh, we'll try to s set out some links to this regard as well, and get, uh, get the ball rolling. But yeah, and just remember that behind every graph there are real people with real values, yeah. real dreams, yeah, real aspirations. Well, what's the Justin link to the report you were talking about that came out a few days ago about? Yeah, I'll send that. That's so. Well, that's a Center for Budget and Policy Priorities report. I'll, I'll, we'll yeah. put it up. So, uh, so thanks guys, we'll see you next week. Oh, one last note. So the videos are not just going in the ether. We're gonna get the uh, the first one up on YouTube, uh, basically tonight. So uh, Ben wants to watch. Ben wants to watch, yeah. send it out. <laughs> you're like, you're gonna be on YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the more you see, the more likely you're on YouTube, right? That's our utility. Oh, thanks guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.